relevance to litigation before the Supreme Court. So, Professor Lempert, thank you for being here. Uh, I would like to thank Dean Barrows and the Toledo Law School for inviting me and to say that these two presentations by Stuart Taylor and myself, each of whom have been among the uh, necessarily the leaders but most vocal figures on both sides of the mismatch rebate, uh, is in the best tradition of education and legal education uh, to present uh, two sides of an issue. Um, where you, it's, it's, however, frustrating, I, I found, often to talk about uh, affirmative action uh, because uh, what I say is where you stand is what you see. It tends to be very difficult to convince people uh, through data and statistics and studies uh, about whether or not mismatch is a problem. Those who begin opposed to affirmative action see mismatch as a serious problem. Those who begin supporting it tend to leave uh, seeing mismatch for what it is, I will say, as not a serious problem and probably not a problem at all. Uh, Richard Sander, who was one of the leading empirical scholars who writes with Professor Taylor, and I, some years ago when these were uh, also live issues, had a series of debates, and it was quite funny. Uh, we debated um, among other venues before the American Sociological Association, and I think it's safe to, s safe to say from the applause and whatever that uh, I just absolutely smeared him. I, I wiped the floor with him. But then sometime later, we debated before the Federalist Society, and I was the one humbly leaving the stage, as nobody believed me. Uh, people often throw up their hands, uh, and they say, you know, I don't, can't follow the social science, but this seems right to me. That's quite unfortunate, because there's a lot of good social science in the area. Uh, there's a lot of good methodologists who've talked about the quality of the social science on the different sides of this issue, uh, and uh, there really is a something to be said that I believe is reliable, and I'll try to say what I think is the most reliable evidence. Uh, your dean just mentioned Fisher versus Texas. Uh, it is a marvelous resource for those of you who want uh, to learn more about this issue, and in particular about the social science of this issue. Uh, SCOTUS blog um, has on its website, just deal, you know, just go to Fisher. Uh, you'll find probably 70 amicus briefs filed on both sides of the uh, case. Uh, there are a handful, uh, maybe two for the plaintiff that I've looked at and three or four uh, for Texas, which deal in detail with their vision of the social science evidence. So anybody who's skeptical about what either I say or Mr. Taylor said or who wants to see for themselves, just go to the website and read the competing briefs on both sides, and if you really want to pursue this, look at the citations in these briefs, and you can decide for yourself without having to uh, believe in Ipsy Dixit from either uh, Mr. Taylor or myself. Uh, this is in many ways a sequential debate uh, in that you've already heard, um, how many here were here for Mr. Taylor's speech? Good, good, you've already heard Mr. Taylor's speech. Um, I'm going to try to respond uh, to a number of the points that uh, Stuart Taylor made. His talk was on the website. I was able to look at it. Uh, this is uh, unfair. Uh, he is not here to respond to what I say. I wish he were here so that we could actually have a face-to-face, -face, though. I will comment that after seeing some of the Republican debates on TV, I'm not sure that debating is always the best format. Uh, to get uh, information across. Uh, but I encourage you, particularly those who agree, or uh, at least as you begin the session, agree with what Mr. Taylor said in his position, and maybe skeptical of some things I say, to ask tough questions uh, to try to represent what he might have said by way of critique to the points I'm going to make. There are actually two narratives about how people who are mismatched uh, and by that I mean that they're measured academic skills, uh, typically by test scores uh, and uh, to some measure by grades received at the prior level, whether that's high school grades if you're applying to college 
or college grades if you're applying to law school or med school or an MBA. There are two narratives uh, that make a kind of intuitive sense. One is uh, the mismatch narrative. People get in over their heads. They're not as qualified, they're not as skilled. They, they may be innately as bright, but they've not had the chance to develop those skills and they find themselves in an atmosphere that's too fast paced uh, so they can't keep up. Uh, Mr. Taylor used the example of his math skills and going to Princeton and not being able to keep up with math geniuses. You know, I thought that was a little bit over the top because I've never met a real law school genius. Uh, math genius is a different uh, order of magnitude and I don't think that analogy holds. But nonetheless, the narrative makes kind of intuitive sense. The other narrative is what you might call the anti-mismatch narrative, which is people rise to challenges. The greater the challenge, the greater the rise. You put in people in the pool who initially can't swim, and they have a choice of swimming and drowning, and suddenly they're across the pool. Um, and the question becomes, in a sense, which of these narratives has more going for it? Uh, we have a lot of research uh, at the K-12 to level, because tracking is a very controversial and much studied uh, policy, which uh, at that level, uh, mismatch loses. The people tend to lag farther behind given equal skills if they're tracked into lower tracks uh, than if they're put in tracks that might consist of people uh, who appear initially more skilled than they are. But that's a different level. The issue is college and beyond. Um, anecdotes. Uh, anecdotes are rhetorical devices. They're really great for conveying a sense of what you mean, the gist of what you say. And we know that anecdotes can be persuasive and persuasive really far beyond the credit that should be given them. Um, and uh, each side can tell its anecdotes and I'm not a great believer as a social scientist in an anecdote, but I really cannot help but comment on the three anecdotes that uh, Mr. Taylor told because I could hardly imagine uh, two of them being worse anecdotes, and one of them, I will suggest, is a quite controversial anecdote. The first one was the Colgate dropout, who dropped out and then dropped back in. Well, that, to me, is a great story. This is a kid who got in that pool, couldn't swim, got out, thought about it, maybe took some swimming lessons, got back in and completed all the laps. And, you know, the alternative for that person was not to get a Colgate education, but to get an education at a school probably far less demanding than Colgate, with credentials far less valuable. And despite the person's difficulty, he chose to go back and he could do it. And I also had to wonder how much of this was because he was in over his head academically. Uh, I went to a small school not too far from here uh, in Oberlin, Ohio. A lot of very bright people went there. Uh, but for schools of its quality, it had an extraordinarily high dropout rate after the first year. Why? Because these kids could not handle the subject matter? Not at all. They could not handle being in a small uh, Ohio town that didn't serve alcoholic beverages <laughs> and enjoyed only two days of spring. Uh, so I, I wondered, you know, why this person uh, dropped out of Colgate. The second was this Amherst student who went there and felt unprepared and like an imposter. Uh, I'm curious, how many of you when you began college felt unprepared and like an imposter? I certainly did. I remember going to Oberlin my first day and seeing all these people who had been to Europe, which I, I barely knew that a Europe existed. So I'm not quite sure what that anecdote proves, except that you know minorities are like all the rest of us. Um, the third is more interesting. Uh, this was a, and he, he gave a name to McWhorter, uh, who said he did not work as hard in high school because he expected an affirmative action boost. I found this interesting because when the Gretter case was being litigated and its companion case, Gratz, this is really the only affirmative action case in which we've had a truly full trial. And one of the points made by students who intervened, uh, minority students, uh, really black students, from Detroit was that the presence of affirmative action at Michigan was an inspiration to them. It was a reason they chose to work hard. They knew they had a chance to get into Michigan. So I don't doubt McWhorter's statement, 
But, you know, you want to give one anecdote on that side, I can give you 100 students in Detroit who are telling anecdotes on the other side. Uh, there are varied individual stories. Uh, if we talk at the individual level, it is almost certainly true that some minorities are hurt by mismatch, uh, which we, by which we mean overmatch. In other words, they get into situations they can't cope. By the same token, it's almost certainly true that minorities, some minorities are hurt by undermatch. Uh, they get into schools uh, that they're actually better than, and, and yet they do worse than they would do because they're not sufficiently challenged. Uh, and it's certainly true that many, many minorities flourish despite ostensible mismatch when they go to schools which they would not have been admitted to uh, but for some attention to their race. The issue, policy-wise, is where does the balance lie? And to look at this, we have to get beyond individual stories. We have to look at the data and responsibly analyze it and see what it tells us. Uh, and one thing it tells us is undermatch is more of a problem than overmatch. Minorities, actually, more minorities suffer from being at schools which they are, in a sense, more capable than attending, uh, then suffer from being at schools that they have credentials which don't match that of their white or Asian colleagues. Uh, I cite a study up here um, that uh, looks in great detail at this, but the study is consistent with a number of other studies that have been done on undermatch versus overmatch. Um, my jaws dropped for the first time listening to Mr. Taylor's speech when he said that there are 20 peer-reviewed studies that support mismatch and zero. He said, how many criticize it? Zero. And I wonder, I, I don't really doubt his good faith, but I wonder if this was a rhetorical trick or a genuine error. Uh, and the reason why is that if he did understand the literature, I just have to think it was a rhetorical trick, but it could have been a genuine error. Uh, that it is very difficult, particularly with peer-reviewed journals, to study, to publish a study criticizing another study. So if what he meant is that there have been, and I would have to say a few, it's not 20 of what he's talking about, particularly if one puts aside, as one should, the science mismatch studies that I will talk about later, uh, that it's very difficult to publish in a peer-reviewed journal uh, an article that simply criticizes the methodology or data used by another article, unless you can accuse somebody of fraud. I know that because the very first study that was published in a refugee journal, and only a few years ago, by Doug Williams, uh, an erstwhile co-author of Professor Sander, uh, in JELS, uh, the Journal of Empirical Clinical Studies, uh, Bill Kidder, a colleague and friend of mine, and I, immediately wrote the editor and said, we'd like to write a response to this study to show the many ways in which it is unreliable. And we got back, by policy, GELS does not publish responses of that sort. Uh, we uh, would require a sort of new data analysis, and we just didn't have time to do a new data analysis, but we had plenty of time to point out all that was wrong with the data analysis in the study they published. So. Yeah, there are a lot of critical studies, but they're critical studies of articles that have been published in the law review, non-peer-reviewed literature. And since the articles we criticize were published in those, uh, the law review literature, uh, non-peer-reviewed, the responses and the critiques are in the same journals because they're the ones that publish it and law reviews are much more open because their pages are much less precious than the pages in high prestige peer-reviewed journals. So they have been uh, numerous have been published, and many of the most cited studies supporting mismatch have not been published in the peer review literature, unless as, uh, and I'm not quite sure, maybe these were part of the 20 peer reviewed studies Mr. Taylor referred to. He said, well, you know, Sanders' study was in a law review, but he showed it to two econometricians or something. That is not peer review. I hardly know of a faculty member who does not show his articles to a few peers and take their comments and see what they think and publish it. Uh, peer review is a much more rigorous and anonymous uh, process in the best journals. So uh, yeah, one cannot look at 
the handful of mismatched studies uh, that have appeared in peer review literature, and most only, again, with the exception of science mismatch, uh, which I'll get to shortly, uh, mainly recently, uh, and find that immediately in the next issue, there's someone <coughs> saying, oops, oops, there's someone saying, uh, you know, this is why this study is no good. Uh, but that's a complete mischaracterization because there are numerous studies, and this is what the peer review literature does publish, which look to see if there is mismatch. And I just took a handful, you can see, you probably can't read them, because there were too many to fit in the page, and I could have written several other pages probably full of these. These are all studies in the peer reviewed literature, some of which set out to investigate mismatch per se, some of which, like the study of my own I will talk about shortly, were written before there was an issue about mismatch, but they all yield results that are inconsistent with the mismatch hypothesis that show either that mismatch does not exist or, quite commonly, come up with results that are more consistent with what one might call reverse mismatch, namely holding credentials constant. Minority students do better if they benefit from affirmative action than if they attend the schools they would have gotten into without affirmative action. So there's a plethora of peer-reviewed studies that call the mismatch hypothesis into question. Uh, as I say, critiques are hard to publish. I've already anticipated that slide. Um, there is uh, the most interesting critique of the key research, studies by Sander and Williams, uh, comes not uh, in um, any article uh, but rather, it came in an amicus brief submitted in the first Fisher case, and in a sense, essence, resubmitted in the current case, uh, which means that after hearing objections, these people reaffirmed uh, the brief. Uh, I, was signed the I was one of the signers in the first brief, and for a long time I was accused of being the principal author. I have told Mr. Sander many times uh, that I had almost nothing to do with the writing of the brief. Um, I don't know if he believes me or not, the brief was written by a very distinguished social science methodologist, the prime author. But the brief concludes, whether one finds Sanders' conclusions highly unlikely or intuitively appealing, his mismatch research fails to satisfy the basic standards of good empirical social science research. The Sander-Taylor brief misrepresents the acceptance of the hypothesis in the social science community and ultimately the validity of mismatch. Numerous examples exist of better ways to perform the type of research Sander undertook. Sander's failure to set up proper controls to test his hypothesis and his reliance on a number of contradictory assumptions lead him to draw unwarranted causal inferences. At a minimum, these basic research flaws call into question the conclusions of that research. In light of the many methodological problems with, underlying with the underlying research, Amici Curiae respectfully request that the court reject Sanders' mismatch research. Now, without naming names, uh, Mr. Taylor said, this brief just is off the wall, we should reject it. Would have been interesting had he named names. Most of the signers in that brief, not all, but most of them had nothing to do before they wrote that brief with mismatch. They had no staked out position, and since then they have no staked out position. Indeed, there are some who may well oppose mismatch for reasons other than the empirical science. I just don't know. I heard a rumor about one, but I have no idea. And the, the people on that, a uh, number of them are the scholars of the greatest, greatest distinction. I don't know if the name Don Rubin makes means anything to any of you. There's no reason as lawyers it should. He is almost a god, if you will, in the world of social science methodology. He's been an absolute pioneer. Um, Gary King, a political scientist, Harvard, is on the brief. Uh, Gary is one of the very top methodologists in political science. Same with Guidon Imbens, who's one of the business world's top and uh, methodologist in econometrician. Um, and um, I'm blanking on the person I, I know absolutely the very best and is a friend, but one of the leading social science uh, methodologists is on that brief. Uh, two of them, uh, King and Rubin, are members of the National Academy of Science. You could not get 
a more blue ribbon group uh, to evaluate research than um, at least half a dozen of the signers on that brief, and I exclude myself. I don't consider myself a leading statistical methodologist. I want to tell you about the Michigan Law School experience. This was done before the mismatch controversy arose. But two colleagues, David Chambers, Terry Adams, and I, uh, did a study. And we looked at the um, performance uh, on the bar and after law school of 27 years, 27 cohorts of Michigan's affirmative action minority graduates. From the very first class admitted uh, with the benefit of affirmative action until classes in the 1990s when we did our study. Um, and we wanted to know uh, how these students fared. Uh, we looked at bar passage. There was essentially no difference. In one, we looked, we trifurcated into decade cohorts. In one cohort, there was a, a statistically significant uh, disadvantage uh, of minorities. It was like 2%. It was sort of meaningless. We had enough cases that it was significant, but it was not truly different. Um, we also looked at outcomes um, after ranging from 27 to like one year. Uh, we looked at three uh, different outcomes. Um, one was the income they were earning. A second was their contentment with the careers they had. And the third was their pro bono um, and other leadership contributions. There were no significant differences. Uh, and candidly, we were a bit surprised by this because it is true that our minority students had worse grades on whole in school than our uh, white students. But there were no significant differences in income. There were no significant differences in career satisfaction. There was a significant difference in the time devoted to pro bono work uh, and the time uh, devoted to community leadership. And by pro bono, we did not mean the person who comes in, hires a lawyer, and doesn't pay a fee, and you write it off as pro bono. Uh, we mm -hmm. meant genuine pro bono work. And the difference was that minorities did substantially more pro bono and other leadership work than our white students. Uh, and even our white students, students did an awful lot by national standards. Uh, I just have one equation to give you a sample of this, which I've put on a slide. Uh, this is looking at um, the income data that we had uh, on our students. Uh, and what was it that explained the variance and who earned a lot and who earned a little? And this is the order we put it in. The first thing that we put in, since we thought seniority would be important, was the year since graduation and also for some technical reasons, the year since graduation squared. That explained far more of what people earned than any other variable or all other variables put together, 16.6% .6 of the variance. Next, we put in gender and age. Uh, that was highly significant, but only explained 2.2% of the variance. Next, we put in minority status. So everything else, except for these two variables, minority status, if it has an effect on income, uh, could explain. It explained one-tenth of 1% 1 of the variance in income. Uh, it was completely insignificant statistically. And then we put in the index we used to admit them. This is what we judge whether people are up to a Michigan education or not. That, too, was a useless predictor, even though it did predict grades. Even though it did predict grades, it explained only 0.2% of the variance. Similarly, insignificant was undergraduate major. Uh, then we looked at the final law school grade point average. That did predict some of the variance. Those of you who are at this point are saying, gee, I don't have to work very hard. Uh, my grades don't matter. No, grades did matter. Uh, they explained close to 5% of the variance. But uh, even though minorities uh, earn lower grades than whites, and even though uh, the uh, index score predicted grades, neither of those mattered uh, at all. They were not proxies. Grades mattered for other reasons, maybe first jobs or other things of that sort. I don't know. But they, it didn't matter um, 
the proxy effect was not there, or it might just be a willingness to work hard. And then finally, job sector. Job sector explained about 8% of the variance. Put simply, if you went into private practice, you earn more than if you went uh, anywhere else. Um, I'm not as adept as I should be, perhaps it's generation with computers, so I could not copy a table, which I would have loved to have had up there uh, from a um, PDF into uh, this. And um, unfortunately, we could not get an overhead projector. But I have a little diagram. You can't see it. But what this shows is on this line, you have index scores. And in this line, you have median income. This is just for one group, the uh, first people in the 1970s. If you look at it, you see to the right of the median, higher index, it's almost entirely white students. And you see to the left, it's almost entirely minority students, some exceptions. But then on the vertical axis, there's income. If you look at it and come up and look at it afterwards, there's no difference at all. There are white students that go all the way down here. There's minority students that go all the way down here. There's a lot of white students, and this line is the median for our class. Here is the median for the national income. The class median income was in the hundred thousands, I believe at this point, or a hundred something thousand. And there's a lot of minority students and a lot of white students up there. No, this shows what these table tells you, no difference. Um, Taylor says there's no, there is no data on career success. I've just given you some. Uh, there's a similar study of Davis Medical School and there are numbers of studies of undergraduates uh, that show the same effect, that going to a higher prestige school, if you are an affirmative action minority, brings with it uh, benefits uh, in higher income after controlling for your index credentials. Um, and let me get, and uh, there's one study, this study by Dale and Kruger is particularly important because they found that uh, for minority students who go to a more prestigious school, they get an income boost later in life. Well, it's true, there are some white students who are placed out because they lose out in those slots, and they may go to a slightly less prestigious school. Dale and Kruger found they do not suffer at all. And one of the explanations they suggest is that minority students gain networking advantages, which the white students have regardless uh, of the, uh, whether they go to a higher school or a somewhat lower school. Taylor said whites and blacks are not sitting in the classroom after the first year. This had me scratching my head. Uh, I taught undergraduate sociology courses as well as law school courses at uh, Michigan. And I had some minority students, blacks and occasional Hispanics in class with me. And I swear 80% of the people sitting in those classrooms were white or maybe 90% I, and they were sitting next to our, my minority students. Uh, so I, I, don't, I just did not get that one uh, in the classroom. Indeed, one of the things Texas did to justify going back to holistic in admissions that considered race was they did a study of their classes. And one of the reasons they wanted to increase their numbers of students beyond what the 10% plan brought in was because they found that like 80% of their small classes under say 25 students had zero or one black student and maybe one or two Hispanics out of a class of 20. Yeah, so maybe the minorities are not sitting in classes with white students. It's because there are no minorities. It's not because we have all these classes that you go to chemistry class and it's all white, and you go to sociology class and it's all black. I taught sociology. I know that's not true. Uh, there are cautions you should be aware of when reading the mismatch literature. One is beware of significance tests without effect sizes. And the American Statistical Association just this last week uh, sent out an announcement saying, Beware, exactly that. The other is beware of percentages without numbers. What numbers do these percents represent? And beware selected quotes. Thus, um, Stuart Taylor mentioned uh, that Arcidio, Cano, and Lovenheim um, supported Sanders' work on mismatch. Well, uh, they wrote in their brief, Sanders and Taylor, the evidence suggests that racial preferences are so aggressive, this is from the City O'Connor and Lovingheim article, that racial preferences are so aggressive that reshuffling some African-American students, some, note, to less selective schools would improve some outcomes due to match effects dominating quality effects. 
The existing evidence indicates that such mass effects may be particularly relevant for first-time bar passage and among undergraduates majoring in STEM fields. Uh, I could, you know, if you want to talk about first-time bar passage, there's lots of problems with that, but I'll go into it later. But then they stop quoting before the next lines, the next sentences, which read, however, shifting minority undergraduates to low-resource, non-selective schools ultimately may, do, may undo any gains from higher match quality, and shifting minorities out of law schools altogether could lead to worse labor market outcomes among these students than had they been admitted to some law schools. Their brief was ostensibly submitted and supported neither party to aid the court. How does it aid the court to include that first paragraph and then not to include the sentences that follow immediately on it, or to leave out the following? Uh, from the same article. Alternatively, schools that wish to practice extensive affirmative action could provide targeted services to these students in order to overcome any mismatch induced by their admission policies, such as offering tutoring and remedial classes. While the evidence in targeted college services is scant, such interventions could be successful in mitigating any negative mismatch effects. So if they were right about the harm, which I don't think they are, and the evidence doesn't show they are, there's other ways than excluding minorities uh, from more selective schools to deal with it. And finally, uh, they do not mention this. A problematic conclusion one could draw from Sanders' results is that everyone is harmed by going to a more elite law school. Uh, if there are cross-race differences in mismatch effects, generalizing these estimates to a sample of African-American students could yield misleading conclusions about the extent of mismatch. So if the best evidence that Mr. Taylor could muster when he talked to you in support of his claims was the Arsidio Kono and Lovenheim article. He is not offering you evidence that if you read it is persuasive in the least. Um, what's wrong with Sanders and his work? I've listed on the board some schools. Uh, school one is very selective, uh, charges $13,700 in tuition, and its student-faculty ratio is 22. Uh, school two is selective, uh, charges 11,200, and its student-faculty ratio is 28. School three is selective, uh, it charges 3,500 3, tuition, uh, its student-faculty ratio is 21. Just look at sc uh, schools two and three. How many people think that a student is more likely to be successful if he or she attends school two than if, and less likely to drop out than if he or she attends school three. How many people think people attending school three is more likely to be successful? Most of you. And, and look at schools five and six. Uh, school five uh, is low selective, charges 6.1 thousand in tuition, and is a student faculty ratio of 22. School six is similarly low selective, charges 3.2 thousand, has a student faculty ratio of 18. How many think the student will be better off in school five than in school six. How about one person? How many think they'll be better off in school six than school five? Again, most of you, and I'm not surprised. I, I did it because I knew that's what you'd say. Uh, but here's what is key, and I'll tell you one more thing about school six. School six consists entirely of historically black law schools. It's schools in which minorities will have many role models. They'll be culturally comfortable. Now we can really say, yeah, school six, they may even do better than people in school four. Well, these schools I should have put in, if I was talking about the research using the bar passage study, tiers one, two, three, four, five, and six. For many years, um, scholars following the lead of Sanders, and also I think um, there's some of this maybe in Linda Whiteman, have just assumed that because they're labeled tier one, two, three, four, five, and six, and because they're mean, index scores follow that order, though I think six may be a bit higher than five, that this was the order of quality. So that if a student at school three or tier three school did better than one of the tier two school, that was evidence for an adverse mismatch effect. Or if a student at school six, uh, again, controlling for credentials, did better than a student at school five or school tier four schools, that was evidence of mismatch effects. But no, it's not. Uh, because this ordering is wrong. If you go back and actually look at how it was coded, the schools were not coded solely 
on the basis of the index scores, but they were put into tiers based on other things like student-faculty ratios. And therefore, all this research, beginning with Sanders' research, including some I've done myself, because I it was years before I looked at it, all this research that uses the bar passage study and assumes there's evidence of mismatch if someone in a lower tier school either is more likely to graduate or more likely to pass the bar than someone in a higher tier school cannot be relied on. And indeed, since most of the studies that have been done are not consistent with Sanders' results but find no evidence of mismatch, if they find no evidence of mismatch, that suggests that if the tiers were ordered correctly, they would have found evidence of reverse mismatch effects, that students are better off going to the more prestigious school. And they certainly are sort of everybody finds that if you go to a tier one school, you're better off if you're a minority. Now, science mismatch. This is the fallback position which opponents of mismatch have taken when they actually uh, pretty much cannot defend the case for pure mismatch. But science mismatch is not to be confused with mismatch. Science mismatch is a student goes to UC Berkeley, let us say, uh, and says, I want to major in a science. Uh, may or may not take a biology course or chemistry course or two, and then switches out to major in English literature or sociology or economics or what have you. And that person's considered a science dropout. Well, maybe the student did not finish a science course, and maybe poor preparation is the reason why. But the student was every bit up to getting a Berkeley degree. The student was not mismatched by going to that college, by going to that exclusive, very high competitive school. The student left with a prestigious degree. So the science mismatch argument, in a sense, if it's an argument against affirmative action, is we should tell students that we're not gonna let you, we're gonna abolish affirmative action, we're not gonna let you get into Berkeley because you'll be better off going to Riverside, which unlike Berkeley that accepts, you know, one in 10 students, Riverside may accept eight in 10, something like that, I don't know, but it's much, much less selective. Uh, because we want you to stick to a science major and you're more likely to do it at UC Riverside. So don't confuse science mismatch with mismatch uh, the way the opponents of affirmative action would like to confuse you. Uh, science mismatch, there is better evidence for it than there is for general mismatch. There's a plausible mechanism uh, because one reason why people leave science when they attend to major in science is so they get poor grades in their science courses, either absolutely or relative to the grades they get in other courses. And they look at that C plus in chemistry and that B plus in political science, and they say, Jay, why am I majoring in chemistry when I'm a B plus student in political science? Um, and it is also true uh, that students uh, who uh, are admitted through affirmative action do tend to do more poorly grade-wise. Why? Because sort of the definition of that admission is you've done worse on a test that predicts your grades. And the test is far from perfect, but it's also far from useless. And it does, to some degree, predict grades. So that's what happens. Uh, but there's much more than mismatch that can, fall, uh, that can lead a person to desist from science. One is, if you've not had a very good science training uh, in high school, you may not know what science really is like and what a science major demands until you get to college. And it may not be what you thought you were getting into. Or you may be wanting to major in science to go to medical school, and then you learn about how difficult it is to medical school. Or you want to major in biology, and you realize that most people who get biology PhDs spend the next 10 years on low-income jobs as postdocs, and you may change your mind. So there's lots of reasons uh, why uh, you, wanna, uh, you might want to drop a science course if you're a minority. Um, and it is also true, and, and just to emphasize this, if you look at people who express an initial interest in science, more than half of those do not end up majoring in science. So it's not as if this is something that somehow afflicts affirmative action minor minorities. They have an interest in majoring in science and somehow can't keep up, uh, and they don't do it. Um, that um, it's quite common uh, to drop a science major. It also doesn't seem to be the case that if you look at the likelihood that minorities will graduate with science majors, that it's necessarily much lower than those uh, that whites will graduate with science majors. What, where there is a gap is if you first look at those who go to college and either before school in their application forms 
or like in the first week or two of college uh, in um, a um, questionnaire, they say, I would like to major in science. If you look at that, there is a gap uh, between um, the uh, white assistance rate and the minority assistance rate. What are the gaps? In three different um, major data sets, the NELS, the gap is 16%. Uh, that uh, I think something like 52% of whites who are initially interested in science uh, don't complete a science major compared to 68% of minorities. Uh, in the NLSF, the National Longitudinal Study of Freshmen, the gap is 17%. And the College of Beyond data set, which has a lot in common with the NELS, uh, it's 17%. So these seem to be huge gaps, evidence for a real science mismatch. But note the figures in parentheses. 16% um, versus 13%. 17% versus 10%. 17% versus 14%. What are those figures in parentheses? They are the gender gap, that women are more likely to drop science majors than men. Women aren't in college because of affirmative action. Are we supposed to say that women uh, should go to lesser schools because if they're interested in science, they're going to drop out at higher rates than men? How much has to be explained by affirmative action of this gap? Well, in one study, it's 3%. In another study, it's 3%, though those, I say, are overlapping. And in one study, it's 10%. Uh, so this gap is not nearly so large as these science mismatch studies would have you believe. It's also the case that numbers matter. Uh, suppose, for example, as a recent study that's going to get a lot of attention and is going to be the lead study, I think, because it's appearing in the American Economic Review, very prestigious journal. It's done by quite a competent um, economist and some colleagues. Um, and I'm afraid people won't understand the data as well as they should. Uh, but it does a number of things. And among other things, it simulates how minority science majors who go to UCLA and Berkeley who have low academic credentials in the bottom half or the bottom quartile of all applicants to the University of California system uh, would have done had they gone to the least selective schools, UC Santa Cruz and UC Riverside instead. Now, according to our city of Kono and the simulation, there would have been a statistically significant increase in the number of um, I put schools, I should put uh, minorities, graduating with science majors if they, if they uh, in fact, uh, went to the less selective, less demanding school. But as I said, beware of percentages. Uh, you have to look at numbers. And unfortunately, in the Arsidio Cono article that is going to be published, uh, there is virtually no information about numbers that the percentages or the stars for statistical significance represent. I was able, because of an earlier version they published, at some effort to actually extract some numbers. These are probably approximations, but they give you an idea, unless I made some serious math mistake, I don't think I did. So if all of Berkeley's low-scoring minorities had gone to Riverside, 47 more a year, that's all, 47 more a year, would have graduated, and 46 more would have graduated had all of UCLA's science-interested minorities gone to Riverside. And I chose Riverside because with Santa Cruz, it's not even this large a number. Um, but if affirmative action kept these science, intended science majors from going to um, Berkeley, it would keep everybody who's in the lower two quartiles from going to Berkeley and so if they went to Riverside, you would have 685 students total at Berkeley, including 56 who finished science majors and got that prestigious Berkeley science degree that would lead to grad school and beyond. They all, they, none of them would have gone to Berkeley. They all would have been in Riverside too, getting that low prestige degree and also displacing some Riverside students, including some who actually graduated with degrees. Uh, and at UCLA, it's even worse, 999 Minority students would not be in UCLA if we didn't have affirmative action at this level, and they would have sacrificed another prestigious degree, and this would have included 164 students who would actually have been able to master the sciences and graduate with science majors 
from UCLA. So you have to be very wary when you're just given percentages and little stars that say statistically significance. Now, before I mention and close, I do want to say there's one point where I agreed uh, with Mr. Taylor, at least if, uh, in my version of it, and that is he calls for greater transparency. I think that really is something I would call for too, so long as it's not done in a racist way. In other words, I see nothing wrong and, and probably a lot good uh, with schools uh, releasing their profiles of people who come in with different high school grade averages and different uh, index scores and saying people who are in this range get grades that range from here to here. People in this range tend to get grades that range from here to here. They major this way, let people do it. What I am opposed to and uh, is the notion that we say are black students, are Hispanic students, because then you can stigmatize lots of people unfairly and give a very false portrait of how capable people are. So I've been accused uh, in print by Professor Senator of being a zealot for affirmative action. Well, I am passionate about some issues. I am deeply committed to racial integration, I mean to racial equality, and as a child of the 50s and early 60s, to racial integration. I am deeply committed to sound social science. These are my passions. But I would not be here before you if sound social science said that minorities were hurt by mismatch, because then affirmative action would not advance equality and integration. I'm here because social science says that it does. Thank you. <laughs> Questions, challenges, uh, want more information, anything. When you had those six tiers on the board, you used the language that we shouldn't exclude minorities, something along the lines. I have not seen anything in this next year that advocates excluding anybody. Rather, just to deal with the situation differently. Secondly, the real problem seems to be ongoing, at least not a high school, not knowing much. And that hasn't really been dealt with for 50 years with all the efforts that have gone into higher education and have had success at bringing people into uh, some of the more prestigious uh, professions. Why, why hasn't that been more of a focus? To get the word, we don't need to have any discussion about differences along racial lines. Well, if the people who are opposed to affirmative action and putting forth a mismatch hypothesis would rally their political allies and spend as much passion, effort, and money in promoting quality K-12 to high school education, something might be done <laughs> about that. Don't forget that uh, we had opposition to busing and high school integration is one of the very best ways we know of increasing the quality of education that minorities receive. We still have that. We have segregated housing by policies. Again, uh, I could not agree more that we should be doing much more with K-12 uh, than we're doing and that a lot of the root of the problem is in K-12 and indeed it's in preschool, it's in childhood nutrition, it's in things like letting people drink lead in their drinking water and live in houses with lead paint peeling off the walls. So yes, you've hit upon a important area. But the two areas where I differ from you is your portrait of students from minority groups entering colleges. These colleges are selective. Well, you, well, I, I thought I heard you talk about people who were not capable of handling uh, the schools they get into. Uh, okay, I'll get, I, I thought I heard that, but if I didn't, I didn't. By exclude, what I meant was that we have a groups of people who are now being admitted to selective schools, minorities, with some attention to race. And it's really important to make that word some stand out. There are many students who are minorities who are of an affirmative action eligible race who never get into schools. Indeed, one of the problems with the Fisher case is a serious question about her standing because I think there were something like 600 minorities who had admissions credentials better than hers who also did not get in to University of Texas because as part of holistic admissions, race is just one thing that is uh, considered. It's not the whole thing. But if you look at today's world and you look at the test scores in part for reasons that you say, 
if you look at the, t the test scores, uh, when uh, if we were to abolish affirmative action, as has happened, and we know it's happened, it's happened in Michigan, it's happened at Berkeley, it's happened at UCLA, it's happened at a number of other schools, you abolish affirmative action even though you use other types of outreach at the, at least the most selective schools, the minority population and the black population in particular is dramatically reduced. You may, maybe you don't call that exclusion. I did call it exclusion and I guess I would still say that compared to the status quo, one of the things that abolishing affirmative action will do will exclude a number of students who now get into these schools from attending these schools. There'll be fewer minorities at these schools. Uh, similar decrement occurs with Hispanics, but the population of Hispanics is growing so rapidly that it's not visible and even in some states like California, it's you know so much greater that there's been a slight increase in numbers, but the increase in numbers fails by far to keep up with the increase in numbers of Latino, Hispanic, high school uh, graduates. And then, but the last point, whether you said it or not, I want to make it again. You have to understand that when these people are admitted, no school wants to admit a minority student who will fail. No school wants to. That's a huge investment of money. It's often an investment of later support services. It's putting your prestige on the line. And the data, not that there aren't exceptions, not as I said, one can always find when you're talking statistics, the people who don't fit. But the data that I've reviewed for you, which is you know, peer reviewed, uh, high quality researchers, indicates that on balance, and it's not even close, the general result is that minorities that go to more selective schools do better in graduating, do better later in life than they would have done had they gone uh, to a school that, in which the median white um, index uh, credential was like their own. What do you think makes a top tier school versus a, a lower tier school? I mean, you had a graph with the, uh, the uh, tuition and the faculty yeah. and student ratio. Uh, I didn't really understand what, what, what that data showed. Did that show the lousy, the cheap versus the high ratio? Is that different? Than, but yeah, the, what makes the University of Michigan Law School I assume you're in the top 25 versus the University of Toledo Law School. The uh, more students here, are they starting off with a bad mark against them? Uh, let, me, let me deal with these questions separately because there's actually two questions you asked. One is about the data. That was the bar passage study. What they did was they got characteristics of law schools, included a variety of things. Uh, a very important one, a very strong one, was the index average index credentials of the admittees. But other things were things like to, uh, student faculty ratio, class total enrollments, a bunch of things. They did what's called a cluster analysis and they grouped the schools together uh, by um, into six different tiers. They actually didn't order them originally. The ordering was imposed on them uh, later. Uh, and it may be an ordering by mean uh, LSAT or index scores, but between two and schools two and three, there's no statistically significant, significant difference in the mean, so one cannot say they're separate. That's one thing. The other thing is what makes a top tier school. You know, in some ways it's history um, and reputation. Uh, you know, every year Michigan gets people who uh, transfer into it who have been you know, top students at schools that in the US News Reporter, 50, 60, 70, 80 schools down below, and large proportion of them graduate near the top of our class. Uh, but we have 300 firms or 400 firms that come interview. Uh, we get Supreme Court justices. We get, you know, there, you know, prestige is something we convey on schools. And because of it, uh, if you look at the mean LSAT scores of students attending Michigan, uh, you'll find that it's significantly higher than students who attend schools that are, you know, 15 places down or 20 or 100, kind of circular because part of the reason schools get ranked is they get ranked on those scores. Part of the reason students with higher scores go to the so-called prestige or so-called elite schools is because they see the rankings. You know, it's very hard. 
uh, for schools that are lower rank, which are terrific schools that have great faculties. I, I've, I've talked to tier six schools and you know, when they had them were tier five schools and been just absolutely impressed with the quality of the faculty and the education they're offering. And yet there they are. So, you know, we have met the enemy and they is us. <laughs> and it's like the Cleveland Browns and the uh, New England Patriots, huh? <laughs> <laughs> I won't go there, but Tom Brady, yes. <laughs> I have a question. Is there anything you found in your evidence about any kind of latent hostility about affirmative action which allows people of color to get so-called reins of power they didn't want to share with them? I'm just trying to find out the end result. If I oppose affirmative action, can you say that my opposition is because I don't want them sharing levers of power? And we consider law school to be a great funnel by which you can obtain levels of power or influence. Uh, I've never seen anything, I mean, like that, uh, but I don't, I don't think it's been studied, so at least not in any rigorous social science way. So the fact that I se haven't seen anything doesn't mean anything one way or the other. Uh, two two um, answers. That he, certainly environment matters a lot. I, at least I'll say that. There's one really interesting study on the science mismatch area um, that uh, looks at where minorities and, and indeed whites for that matter persist and finds that certain schools are much more likely to have people follow through on intended science majors than others. These are schools that have sort of not overly committed to research, but not having no research at all. They tend to be smaller schools. They tend to have small class sizes. Um, so even in that area, we see that just institutional characteristics affect uh, the results uh, that we get uh, from these schools. So yes, uh, institutional characteristics uh, can and do matter. And there was one of the question back here. Um, I agree with this gentleman when he said that um, as far as the issue of being against uh, affirmative action is sort of a waste when the energy, I agree with you, when you say the energy should really be put into preventing the need for it. So um, this makes me wonder as an educator and as an educational advocate, um, it makes me wonder how can you know the people in law um, fighting for affirmative action, join forces with those in education to actually remedy the problem. Because it seems like we're fighting for something that, as we've said over and over, can easily be prevented. And it's not just academics, but it's so many levels, as this gentleman raised just now. Um, it's emotional, it's mental, you know, hence why the environment is such a factor. Yeah, it's, well, I, I Sadly, I have to disagree with you about one thing you said, and that is easily be prevented. These are incredibly difficult problems when you have populations in poverty. Uh, when you have, you know, one, I don't know, what is it, six or eight black males who are fathers in prison. Uh, th there's a, in, in one way, if you really are talking about absolute prevention, we do need a kind of social revolution. That does not mean that they can't be substantially ameliorated by a host of programs. And you know, as a leader in your community after you graduate, which is a lawyer you are likely to be, uh, you can work on your own and with other groups that ex are out there to lobby for these things, to contribute your time, to litigate for them uh, and the like. And I think that is particularly uh, an important way to go. I mean, note I talked about minorities doing more pro bono. Why do they do more pro bono? I think it's simply because everybody wants a minority <laughs> to help advocate their positions. They're called on more. I don't think they're more virtuous than our white graduates, but I think they just have many more demands on their time and they are prone to say yes because they want to do what you want to do 
which is to help solve these problems. I also meant to say one more thing. Uh, as I said, Taylor is, is right that, you know, because these credentials predict grades that minorities tend to get lower grades. But there is this joke, if you will. Uh, what do you call the man who graduates last in his class from the Harvard Medical School? Doctor, exactly. Grades are not life. I mean, the question becomes, what is your skill level? We wouldn't graduate you if you couldn't, you know, <laughs> graduate and pass the bar. Um, any, okay, is that, anyway, thank you very much. I appreciate it.